gentlemen. It's a real pleasure for me to be here today uh, to address uh, this uh, meeting, especially because uh, I'm a huge fan of, of the work of both Mark, his colleague Faith, and, and basically the concept for this uh, journal, uh, long, long overdue. Um, let me uh, give you a little bit of a preface about what I do, if you're not familiar uh, with my work. So I'm an adjunct professor here. I have uh, several other hats. I teach military theory at Quantico at the Marine Corps University. Uh, and also with my wife, Catherine Gorka, we have several institutions that we run, for-profit and not-for-profit, that focus on the national security threat to the United States, specifically terrorism, and within that, the ideology of jihad. And that's really going to be the topic of what I wish to uh, discuss with you today. Um, my area of expertise, I, as you can tell, I wasn't born here. Uh, I'm genetically a Hungarian. My parents were Hungarian. I was born in the UK. Uh, I'm now a proud Hungarian, uh, proud American. Um, but uh, what I do is, with our war fighters, with members of our intelligence community, and uh, with our law enforcement, especially at the federal level uh, in the FBI, I try and get them inside the mind of the enemy to understand the strategic culture of jihadist groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And I'm going to share a little bit of that work uh, with you today. So um, what is it that Al-Qaeda uh, wished to achieve and how has ISIS stolen the limelight from them? Um, let's begin by setting the stage. Let's talk about the macro context within which we have to think about foreign policy, uh, national security, and the future of the republic. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the reality of the world in which we live today. Uh, we are being driven, of course, by the domestic agenda of being in the middle of uh, presidential uh, uh, elections. But let's look around the world. Whichever cardinal point of the compass you choose, you find the rise of a very specific threat. Whether it is Nigeria with the Chibok girls, uh, whether it is uh, Lieutenant Kassas Bay in the cage, or whether it's the streets of the UK or the streets of San Bernardino, uh, what is going on? Well, we have 300 girls who are kidnapped by Boko Haram. Why? Because they are Christians. We have a man who is burnt alive. Why? Because he dared as a Muslim to go against the Islamic State. Bottom right hand corner is who? Does anybody recognize the individual on the bottom right? He is a soldier. So there were two jihadis of African descent who uh, were staking out a British army base and a drummer Lee Rigby exited the base to an ATM to get some money from a cash point and at that point uh, two jihadis ran him down at 40 miles an hour Lee Rigby was still barely alive and so they proceeded, you can see this man's hands are covered in blood, they proceeded to decapitate him on the streets of the UK. This isn't Mogadishu, this is England. In the center, what do we have? Just when we thought the Islamic State uh, couldn't get more perverse, uh, one of their videos from uh, last year, they can't be bothered anymore to decapitate us manually with a knife, and now they have a new use for detonating cord. They wrap their prisoners' necks with detonating cord, uh, ignited it, and at 3,000 feet per second, those individuals' heads were severed from their shoulders. And lastly, bottom left-hand corner is a photograph that you will not have seen uh, widely distributed in the mainstream media. Uh, does anybody know who that is? Yes, that is Farouk, one of the two San Bernardino shooters, uh, who was uh, finally, after executing the largest terrorist attack on U.S. soil since 9-11, uh, intercepted uh, by the local police authorities. I know you've seen photographs of the SUV, yes, with about you know, 600 round bullet holes in it, yes. Um, that's the aftermath of that engagement. I always say to my Leos, my law enforcement officers that I brief, you've got to love the San Bernardino police officers. They've pumped about a thousand rounds into the vehicle. They pull him out and just in case, let's cuff him. You never know. You never know. Um, so more, more seriously, what's the connective tissue? 
whether it's Nigeria, whether it's uh, England, whether it's uh, ISIS territory, or whether it's California, there is one connective tissue, and that's the ideology of jihadism. And that's what we need to appreciate. We need to understand the role of religion, albeit a 7th century version of Islam, but the role of religion in the national security context today. Next slide. So what I'd like to share with you now um, is the work that Katie and I have been doing for several years now for Fort Bragg, for U.S. Army Special Operations Command, the home of the Green Berets. We ran a two-year project for the outgoing commanding general, uh, General Charles Cleveland, and this is uh, uh, one of the products that came out of it. We're very, very uh, proud of this report. It is unclassified, and the uh, lieutenant general has allowed us to distribute it with anybody who is so interested. My last slide will have my email address. If you wish a full copy of the report, then please just send me an email. But let me share with you what we found about the threat environment today and what it means for America and why ISIS is so uniquely dangerous. Next slide. Just press the down button. It's much quicker. Okay. So, um, there are four unimpeachable, unclassified open source metrics of why ISIS is much more dangerous than Al-Qaeda. You can read the full report, but I'll very quickly walk you through these four metrics. Number one, unlike Al-Qaeda, ISIS is a fully-fledged trans-regional insurgency. Now, that's a very dense sentence, but let me unpack it. For the last 15 years, in what, whichever theater it was active, Al-Qaeda never really functioned as its own insurgency. Uh, very wisely, what did it do? It identified a pre-existing insurgency, went into that region, and piggybacked on top of it. Whether it was Al-Shabaab in Somalia, whether it was the Taliban in Afghanistan, neither of those insurgent groups were actually recruited or created by bin Laden. Simply like a parasite, he attached his organization on top of it. ISIS is different. ISIS generated what we call its own mass base. It has recruited, uh, again, all of this is unclassified, more than 75,000 jihadists to date, okay? Not borrowing them from somebody else or re-flagging a pre-existing organization, but recruiting their own base of tens of thousands of jihadists. Not only that, we know that it's functioning where? In multiple countries, it now holds territory in Iraq, Syria, Libya. It holds more land than is the size of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. The caliphate of IS, of the Islamic State, has more than six million souls living on it today. Yes? Now, this is stunning because if you look at the history of ir irregular warfare of insurgency, pick any insurgency of the 20th century. It really doesn't matter who it is. Mao in China, FARC in Colombia. What is always the single objective that they have? They're all the same. They have one strategic objective, to take down the government of the nation in which they are fighting and to replace it. Mao wanted to take down the nationalist government. FARC wants to replace the elitist Hispanic government in Bogota. They're always about one thing, taking down one government. Well, what about ISIS? It's a little bit more ambitious. It's not one government, it's all governments, starting with the Middle East, North Africa, and West Africa. And it's not only in one region, it is trans-regional. About a year ago, Boko Haram swore bayat again to ISIS, swore allegiance to the Caliph, to Abu Bakr. This time, their oath of allegiance, of fealty, was accepted. ISIS incorporated them into the new caliphate. Subsequently, Boko Haram changed their name. Nobody who works African issues should call them Boko Haram. They now call themselves the West Africa province of the Islamic State. And it's more than just changing labels on, you know, the letterhead. It's much more significant. This means that the Islamic State now de facto and de jure from the point of view of Sharia now controls territory not only in multiple countries of, of one region, the Middle East, but now multiple countries of multiple regions, including West Africa. To put it in English, we have never ever seen this before in the history of insurgency. Never a trans-regional insurgency. If there is a JV team, it is not ISIS. 
If there is a JV team, it is the uh, Al-Qaeda or perhaps even us. Uh, second, just running through these metrics very quickly, it's the richest threat group of its kind in human history. If we look at non-state actors, uh, the Financial Times has estimated that ISIS makes uh, $500 million per year in illicit oil sales, kidnapping, racketeering, and local taxation. Uh, from two bank raids in 2014, ISIS netted a total of $823 million. In two bank raids, $823 million. Let's put that into perspective for a second. Does anybody know how much the 9-11 uh, attacks cost Al-Qaeda? It's in the 9-11 Commission report. If you read it, there's a complete for financial forensics breakdown. The whole operation, from student visas, to safe houses, to flight schools in America, to the box cutters at the end, the whole operation cost $500,000. Uh, $500, okay? You can't even buy a house, right, in most parts of D.C. for that. That attack did $1 trillion worth of damage to the U.S. economy in the first 12 months. It's quite an investment. Invest $500,000, get a trillion in return. ISIS, from two bank raids, walks away with the equivalent of 1,600 So if they consolidate their territory and decide to send operatives this way, they could make 9-11 look like a small incident. Third is foreign fighters, their capacity to recruit. Truly staggering is what the CG called it, and I completely concur with him. In just the first 19 months of renewed ISIS operations in Iraq, uh, uh, nine months, they recruited 19,000 foreign jihadis. That's on top of Iraqis and Syrians. Those are people from the outside, including Americans, Brits, Germans, Frenchmen, you name it. Uh, uh, we now know that of the 75,000 fighters belonging to ISIS, 36,000 are Westerners, 6,000 of whom, sorry, 36,000 are foreigners, 6,000 of whom are Westerners with American passports, British passports, passports from countries that are part of the visa waiver program. Al-Qaeda in 10 years recruited 55,000 fighters. ISIS has recruited that in a matter of months. Again, hardly a JV team. But the most important thing of all, and the thing that we don't discuss, and it's really the, the meat of what I want to share with you, is what makes ISIS different can be summarized in one thing. What they did on June 29, 2014. When Abu Bakr uh, climbs the pulpit of the Grand Mosque in Mosul, and declares the Islamic State, the Caliphate re-established, he has achieved that which no other jihadi organization has been able to do for 90 years. So Ataturk dissolved the Caliphate. He dissolved the Ottoman Empire. He fired the Caliph in 1924, gave him his pink slip. For the next 90 years, scores, if not hundreds, of organizations were created with the express mission of re-establishing the caliphate. Starting with, of course, who? The Ikhwan Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood, right up to Al-Qaeda. All of them, all of them are united by their desire to undo what Ataturk did and see the caliphate return. But every single one of them failed, totally. But what about ISIS? They didn't talk about it, they just did it. And this is why religion and the transcendental, understanding the power of the transcendental is crucial to understanding the threat to America. So how is ISIS doing this? Why is ISIS so much more successful than all other jihadi groups? Next slide. Well, a lot of it has to do, of course, with this man. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the new caliph, the head of uh, the Islamic State. If you haven't done so, if you're interested in the threat to America, I strongly suggest that after this event, later in the week, go on to YouTube or go on to the Clarion Project or go on to Memory, the Middle East Media Research Institute's website. Watch this video. It is worth 25 minutes of your time. Watch Abu Bakr's address to the world with English subtitles, you can Google it, you can find it at Memory or Clarion or probably on YouTube. Because this is 
the commander's threat statement. This is the intent statement of the organization that wishes to either kill you or enslave you. And it is essential viewing. But let's just look at that screen capture from the video for a moment and compare it, if you will, in your mind to the last 15 years of Al-Qaeda videos that you've all seen. Yes, Bin Laden's videos from a cave somewhere. Then after we killed him, Zawahiri's videos. Compare and contrast. How did they present themselves and what did they wear? Do you remember what those videos looked like? Next slide. You remember? They all had Bin Laden, or later Zawahiri, dressed in what? Military clothing with a weapon behind them. But let's be a little bit more specific. It is a, 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 a American issue M65 field jacket. That is one of our field jackets, an American one. And what's behind him? Not an AK-47. It's a much more specialized weapon. It's an AK-74. It's a different caliber, much shorter barrel, and a folding stock. That is the weapon of who? The elite Soviet paratroopers, the Desaniki and the Spetsnaz, the equivalent of the Soviet special forces. So he's wearing our jacket with behind him the equivalent of the Russian special forces rifle. Why? To send you a very simple message. He is a warrior. He is a combatant commander and such an effective one that he is wearing the uniform of the current superpower he's facing. And he has behind him what? The most exclusive piece of equipment from the last superpower he defeated. Because that's how he looks at it. It wasn't the Pashtuns with our Stinger missiles. It was, of course, who? Him and his Arab Mujahideen that defeated the Soviet Union. And there's only one superpower left. It's us. And he's going to destroy us. Next. Next slide. Where's Abu Bakr's camouflage jacket? Where's his digicam field jacket? Where's his weapon? There's no weapon. Why? What's the huge difference between ISIS and Al-Qaeda? One thing, the point of why we're here. This man doesn't have to convince the world that he's a great military leader. He does not have an inferiority complex. Why? Because 13 days before he gave this sermon, what had happened in that city? His forces took it. Second biggest city in Iraq that our Marines and our soldiers used to patrol fell to his forces. You want to know how good a military commander I am? Open a newspaper. Switch on the television. I don't need to prove myself, but what I want you to understand is who I really am. Look at where I'm standing. The Grand Mosque. Not just any old mosque, the Grand Mosque. And what am I wearing? He's not actually wearing a shalwar kameez. If you look at the video, it's hard to tell on the screen capture. But can you see how his uh, outer garment is flaring out at the bottom? That's because he's wearing the cloak of the ulama. He is wearing the cloak of the religious authority, the wise man of Islam, because he's spent sending a very specific message. I may be a great military commander, but I am foremost and firstly a religious leader. I am the caliph. Oh, and just in case we didn't get it, you know his name isn't really Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Yes, that's his nom de guerre. That's his war handle. Why would he choose to call himself Abu Bakr? Who knows their Muslim history? Guided the first rightly guided caliph. So, this is not an exaggeration. Every Muslim in the world, from a two-year-old in a you know, sandbox playing in Bangladesh, right, all the way across Europe, South Asia, Central Asia, every single Muslim in the world associates the name Abu Bakr with one person. Mohammed's father-in-law and his closest disciple, who when Muhammad died without a will and testament, became the first caliph after Muhammad. Every Muslim knows that name. And what has he done? He's named himself Abu Bakr, taken Mosul, 
declared the caliphate and himself as the new caliph. None of this is accidental. It's as if he'd chosen the name George Washington, right, prior to going to war. That's a kind of a flavor of what we're talking about. Next slide. But it's not just about him. It's really about the role of religion, at least eschatology. In D.C., inside the Beltway, for about two years, we've had a food fight on what do we call this threat group. Some people say ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Others say ISIL, the commander-in-chief, prefers the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. A lot of people give him grief because they say he wants to say ISIL so he doesn't have to mention the word Syria and remind people about those red lines. Let's just quietly forget about those red lines. That's politics. Why? Both of those names are wrong. They are technically incorrect. When you go to war, you do an intelligence preparation of the battlefield, and before you label the enemy, what do you do? Do you, uh, do you go to your draw of unused threat group labels? How do you label your enemy? Based upon what they call themselves. I'm a child of the Cold War. I was formed by the Cold War. I, I miss it immensely. It was much easier. But the Second Red Army, we called them the Second Red Army. Why? Because they called themselves the Second Red Army. It wasn't the second thing our intel shop counted that day. So, what does this group call itself? Originally, seven, eight years ago, it was what? It was AQI. It was the Iraqi sub-franchise of Al-Qaeda. Today, even the FT and the Economist simply calls it what? IS. After it declares caliphate, they call themselves the Islamic State. They're very clear. There are no Islamic States except ours. Not Pakistan, not Saudi Arabia. They're all Apis states. We are the Islamic State. But what's most interesting is all, of all is what they called themselves in the intervening years. Between being AQI and be, before becoming the Islamic State, they referred to themselves as the Islamic State of Iraq and Al-Sham. Now, what is Al-Sham? If you look it up in an Arabic dictionary, you will find two definitions. The first is the simplest one. Al-Sham, the land that rises from the sea, which roughly equates to that area on the map, which cartographically we would transpose as greater Libya, uh, sorry, greater Syria, or the Levant. That's where we get ISIS or ISIL. But that's a fraction of the word's meaning. If you read the next definition, it will tell you Al-Sham, a very significant eschatological term in the religion of Islam. Eschatology, end times, judgment day. Every religion has an eschatology, Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, Zoroastrians, they all have an eschatology. The story the religion tells their beliefs about how history will end. Well, Christian eschatology tells us about what? You read the book of Revelation, you read other eschatological works, and there will be what? A series of mighty battles across the earth between the forces of the darkness led by the Antichrist and the last true Christians. And a pivotal battle will occur where? Megiddo, yes? Northern Israel, a real place. It's where we get the English word Armageddon, comes from the city of Megiddo. Well, have a wild, impetuous guess as to what our sham is. Al-Sham is the Megiddo of Islam. Muslims have a very rich eschatology, parallels Christian eschatology with some very significant differences, especially the role of Jesus at end times, but we can leave that for Q&A. Um, the uh, Islamic eschatology also has a, an antichrist-like figure. It's not Christ, it's, it's a devil man, if you will, leading the forces of the kufr, the infidel, in a series of battles against the last true Muslims before Judgment Day. And Al-Sham is the area of the world where the last jihad will occur. It's important to internalize this. Muslims are taught that that area in the Middle East is the site of the last holy war before all human beings who have ever lived will be judged. So when ISIS gets up on Twitter gets up on social media posting more than 55,000 posts per 24 hours, okay? I mean, they really are eating our lunch when it comes to psychological operations. 55,000 social media posts per day. 
when they say we are the Islamic State of Al-Sham, what message are they sending to that hormone-laden 17-year-old man in his mom's basement? They're saying very simply, look, young man, your daddy may have fought the Soviets in Afghanistan, and that's great. That makes him a mujahid. Your uncle may have fought the Serbs and the Croats in Bosnia or the Indians in Kashmir. That qualifies him as a jihadi. But if you want to finally cleanse your soul from all the wrong things you've done, if you want to guarantee your own salvation and the salvation of your loved ones, oh, and get those 72 virgins, the clock is ticking because look at where I am. Not only have I named my threat group after a territory you know well, I have proceeded to capture that territory, meaning I have initiated the final jihad. There will be no more jihads after this one. So if you really want to go to heaven, you better buy your plane ticket to Turkey and walk on over. As far as I'm concerned, this is the only way to explain 36 thousand foreign fighters recruited to ISIS and if you don't appreciate the role of religion in the mobilization of those who would kill us then you really you know what do they say about the Washington Post if you don't get it you don't get it well if you don't get this you definitely don't get it next slide this is a slide my wife uh, Katie did for the FBI's counterterrorism division. Um, you're probably familiar with Word Cloud Software. Word Cloud Software takes a text like a speech or a chapter in a book and instantly converts it into one visual, a cloud, based upon how often individual words are used. The more often a word is used, the larger it will be and the closer it will be to the center of the cloud. So it's an instant way to identify what? Emphasis what matters to the writer or the speaker, because they're repeating it so many times. This is the English language translation of Abu Bakr's speech from uh, Mosul, June 29th, 2014, translated into a word cloud. Now, let's see if we've got any budding pilots out there with really good eyesight. Can anybody see either the word Syria or the word Iraq on that word cloud? One of them is there, but it is very small. Peace. Correct. Under peace and above the crook of the H is the word Iraq. He barely even mentioned it. Oh, and by the way, he never mentioned Syria. Not once. Not once. And we have an administration that has said what? Oh, this is about uh, a bunch of crazy guys who are angry at Assad and didn't like what Maliki did. This is about Iraq and Syria and a few airstrikes and we'll sort it out. Well, let's listen to the enemy. What is he doing it for? Number one, the glory of God, Allah. Secondly, the Ummah, the global community of Muslims. He's explicit. Look, guys, I'm doing it for you, all of you, all Muslims. This is why I'm fighting. And third, most important of all, operationally on that day, the caliphate. I am re-establishing the theocratic empire of Islam. And we think a few, you know, special operation strikes and some bombing runs will solve the problem. Probably not. Next slide. Okay, I ideally hope everybody in this room, this is the only audience that really should get it, uh, knows what that symbol is. It's not a cycloptic smiley face, it is of course what? It is noon, the letter N in Arabic, which is graffiti, means followers of the Nazarene live here. Christians. It's like the yellow star of David in Hitler's ghettos for the Jews. Um, when Mosul fell, ISIS marked every house with Christians in that city with the letter N, and then gave the residents inside, who are members of an ancient Christian community, almost as old as the Copts of Egypt, and said, look guys, uh, you can uh, choose between converting to the one true faith, uh, recognizing your infidel status and being punished for it with a jizya, a tax, and never being allowed to hold office in, in the public sphere and never being allowed to build another church. Oh, and the third option is we will kill you. I had a, an employee, a very brave American uh, lady in, in theater when this was happening. I can tell you there are no Christians left. There are no Christians left in Mosul. <coughs> to understand what this means, when we invaded Iraq in 
2003, there were 1.4 million indigenous Iraqi Christians. Not Filipino immigrants, yes, indigenous Arab Christians, 1.4 million. Today, there are significantly less than 200,000 left in their homes. Whichever way you look at that, that is religious genocide. More than a million Christians murdered or forced into exile. Whatever your own personal belief system, the point of this slide is one thing. This is the kind of power Al-Qaeda dreamt of having for 20 years. Never ever got close to it. Not once did they get close to this level of power. ISIS didn't dream about it. They made the nightmare a reality. They are committed and they are capable. Next slide. So we could spend hours on this, but let me just give you one slide. Our administration, and this started under the Bush administration, so this is a pretty bipartisan thing, it's just out of control now. Um, this administration has made a policy decision that is driving our strategy for the last seven and a half years. And the decision is the following. Religion has absolutely nothing to do with this conflict. It is wholly irrelevant. Uh, the deputy pre pre press spokesman for the State Department on national television has stated, we will be safe, there will be no more jihadists as long as they get jobs. <laughs> right? This is the jobs for jihadis from Maria Half. Yeah? It's all about economics and poorly educated people. That's why people become terrorists, because they don't have a job and they're stupid. Okay? Really? Let's have another look. ISIS propaganda videos, we have the Egyptians uh, executed in Libya and the Jordanian fighter pilot uh, burnt alive by ISIS. So religion doesn't matter, really. You've seen hundreds of videos like the lower right with uh, captured uh, hostages decapitated by ISIS from our citizens to these Egyptians. Hundreds of videos of decapitation. Why was Lieutenant Kasaspe not decapitated if everybody else was? That's the punishment for infidels. Not an infidel, an apostate. An apostate. He's not a kufr. He's much worse than, a, than an infidel. Yes. So, uh, the bottom right hand uh, may be Arabs from Egypt, but of course they're Copts. They're Christians. So they are infidels. As a result, ISIS refers to what? The Sunnah of Islam. And not the Pacific early parts of the Quran that were from the Meccan period, but the period after, the second half, the Medinan and the Hadith and the other Sunnah that state explicitly what? You capture a Kufr in warfare, thou shalt smite them on the neck. It's not being capricious. It's not being random. It is following Holy Scripture religious tradition, sunnah, the word of God. Thou shalt smite them on the neck. Okay, so we have to decapitate you if you're an infidel. But what is Lieutenant Kasaspe? He's not an infidel. He's not even a Shia. ISIS hate Shia. They won't even use the word Shia in their publications because they're heretics. This is what? What religion is the man in the cage? Sunni. Sunni right? He's from Jordan. So he's like ISIS. He's a Sunni Muslim. But what did he do? He put on a flight suit, he climbed into a cockpit, and he executed a bombing run against the Islamic State. The second he did that, from the point of view of the Islamic State, he had committed what? Apostasy. He is a Muslim who has declared war on Islam. He has excommunicated himself. So what did they do? They go to the Sunnah of Islam, which again is explicit. When you capture an apostate in war, Thou shalt treat them as if they are already in hell. No decapitation. You douse them in accelerant and burn them alive on video. So we have the very smart people, yes, here in D.C. saying religion is irrelevant. Yes, these are not the droids you're looking for. Yes, okay. And then we have what? An enemy who is so suffused by religious doctrine that right down to the question of how you treat individual classes of prisoner and the method you use to execute them, that is driven by a religious determination. So, fantasy land, ground truth.
Next slide. Last thing I want to do to bring it all back home, lest you think this is a function of something happening 8,000 miles away, um, I'd like to share with you our latest report. So uh, my wife and I, uh, as I told you, we have our own company that supports the warfighter and the intelligence community. It's called Threat Knowledge Group. And uh, a week before San Bernardino, we published uh, uh, this report on ISIS, the threat to the United States. The motivation for this report that I will share with you, if you, I'll, you can just email us and I'll share it with you, is the following. We were getting a lot of contradictory signals from the government, from press statements and stuff coming out of the Bureau and elsewhere, of what's really going on in America with regards to ISIS. We're hearing positive, negative uh, stuff being, uh, uh, people getting arrested, all kinds of contradictory information. So we said, okay, let's spend a few months just collecting all the open source unclassified information. Just sifting it and putting it into one short report. And this is the product. The first thing I'll do, next slide, this is not from our report. This is from another report that confirms why we were right to write this report. There is a liberal professor for, called Kurtzman. He's from Chapel Hill. And every year, Duke publishes a report on Muslim American involvement in violent extremism. Professor Kurtzman wrote this week, this year's report, the 2015 report, which you can access online. I'm just sharing with you the first figure from page two, which confirms everything we were hearing from within law enforcement that was not being confirmed. 2015 was the bumper harvest for jihad. If you look at every year since 9-11, last year saw the highest incidence of jihadi activity on the soil of the United States. Remember, the day before San Bernardino, the President of the United States and the Secretary of State said the following, we are winning this war and ISIS is contained. That is within a day of the largest terror attack on US soil since 9-11. Let's look at our report. Next slide. So this is simply a map of ISIS arrests or incidents in America. Please note, this is not jihadi, or it isn't Al-Qaeda. This is solely ISIS. And it's not concentrated in any one area, from California to Maine. We have killed or arrested more than 90 individuals in America since the caliphate was declared who are connected in one shape or form to ISIS. More than 90. The director of the FBI has stated there are more than 900 ongoing threads being investigated in every state of the union. And that's just ISIS. So think about it. That means Alaska. That means Hawaii, there's an ISIS investigation. Next slide. Okay, I'm genetically a Hungarian. Hungarians are good at one thing, as you probably may know. We are born pessimists. Okay? I am really good at depressing people. I'm an American now, but I still have Hungarian genes in my blood. Let me give you the really bad news. If you break down those arrests, those interdictions, into what those people were doing, there are three major clusters. The largest cluster, just over 50%, are what the Bureau, I love the, the, this euphemistic phrase, they, the, they call these people travelers, okay, <laughs> travelers. These are people who live here, Americans or, you know, naturalized citizens or people that are, you know, immigrants, they live in America and they've decided to swear by up to ISIS and leave America to go and fight the jihad in the Middle East, right? So they're buying their plane ticket to Turkey, they're going to walk across the border, and they're going to fight in Iraq, Syria, Libya, or what have you. So just over half. Then 19, 20% are the management level terrorists. They're the talent spotters, the recruiters, the people who buy the plane ticket for the jihadi so that they can go to the Middle East. But they're really worrisome statistic. This is about a month old. We update this uh, every week on our website. You can see the latest figures. Now the figure is 33.3%. So exactly a third of everybody we are intercepting in America has made a specific decision that they're not going anywhere. 
They have decided that the best way to serve the new emperor, to serve the new caliphate, is not to leave America, but to kill Americans on U.S. soil, because they are infidels. As a result of that statistic, we concluded in our report, the likelihood of a Paris-type attack on U.S. soil is not a question of if, it is a question of when, and we published that report one week before San Bernardino. Next slide. So to conclude, the most important question in all education is, so what? What does this all mean for you, for the nation? Number one, ISIS has been far more successful than Al-Qaeda for one pivotal reason. It's effective exploitation of a highly resonant ideology, what I call in my course here at, at uh, IWP, the enemy threat doctrine. This is a Cold War phrase, we don't use it anymore because it's politically incorrect. It is the enemy threat doctrine. The Nazis had one, the Soviets had one, and the global jihadi movement has an enemy threat doctrine. The second conclusion, that enemy threat doctrine is religious, whether you like it or not, I'm sorry. I don't care whether you see yourself as a sophisticated, postmodern, secular individual who treats going to church on Sunday or temple as, as a social club, right? Doesn't matter. The enemy, you may not agree with Huntington. That's okay. But guess what? The enemy does. The enemy believes in clash of civilization, and he is recruiting based upon a religiously defined ideology. If you wipe that out of our intelligence assessment, you are committing national security malpractice. Yeah? The practitioners don't do it because I know them. I work with them. I've trained more than 10,000 guys in the last seven years. It's the politicians above them. Think about it. 40% of uh, the intelligence analysts at CENTCOM, 40% in a climate survey last week have declared they do not have confidence in the intelligence product that their command is publishing because of political pressure to change the evaluations of ISIS's strength. In the history of America, that's never occurred. 40% of our professional intelligence community doesn't trust the stuff that they are producing because of the political distortion that's being pushed from the top. That's how you lose wars. Third, self-censoring the above truths endangers our war fighters and our citizens and will prolong this war. We in the last, and again, this is bipartisan, I mean, this is not just the current administration, but the last 15 years has been an exercise in whack-a-mole, in trillions of dollars worth of whack-a-mole. We find a bad guy and we kill him. We're at, I mean, trust me, I know these guys. We're really good at this. The Deputy Director of Special Operations told me one day, if I have the GPS coordinates of a leader in Al-Qaeda, if I get the Secretary of Defense or the President to give me a green light, I can kill that man in the next 76 hours. We can do it. I mean, nobody comes close to what we can do. But what if we kill that person, and then the next day 20 people of a similar caliber volunteer to replace him. What does that drone strike or that ODA, that special mission become? It's become a recruiting platform for the enemy. We're just going to be whacking moles. If we don't understand how to take down the ideology of the enemy, your children, my grandchildren, will be fighting this war 50 or 100 years from now. So lastly, to conclude, we cannot win this war if we deny the truth of who our enemy is and what they want. Sun Tzu was right. You've got to know the enemy. But everybody forgets the last part of that quote. Yeah? If you go to fancy you know, cocktail parties in Georgetown and somebody says Sun Tzu, oh yes, know your enemy, right? Okay, wrong. What did he really say? He said, you will win half of your battles if you know your enemy. If you want to win the war, you must know yourself and why you are fighting. I stood in a room of 70 Special Forces guys and giving them a two-hour version of this. And in the end, in the Q&A, young officer stood up in front of his peers and superiors, and this took some doing. And this is a, a unit that was just about to deploy back into theater. And he said, I'm going back into theater for my fourth rotation, and I still haven't been told really why I'm going. 
He said, I've decided because I've got a family, I've got a wife and kids, and I have to decide why I'm going. But think about that. That man is going for the fourth time into the war zone, and he hasn't been told by his commander because his commander hasn't been told by our president. What are we doing? Are we hunting terrorists, building schools? What are we doing? Yeah? You cannot win a war if you move the goalposts every six months. Yeah? Imagine playing a game, right? And they change the rules every 15 minutes and they didn't tell you. You, you wouldn't know whether you're winning, right? You wouldn't know how you score. That's where we're at. Last slide. If you want to, uh, oh, sorry, penultimate slide. If you want to go deeper, um, I wrote a piece on the real center of gravity of the global jihadi movement for the Greenberry Magazine Special Warfare. Uh, if you want to access the article, it's at that scribbed link as a PDF. If you want the real grad school uh, analysis, you have to ch check out my wife's book, Fighting the Ideological War, that you can find online. Uh, she, we took the very best national security practitioners from the Cold War, such as the president of IWP, such as uh, Bob Riley, the head of uh, Voice of America, people who broke the Soviet Union. And we put him in a room with the very best experts on jihad, people who read the jihadi black web in you know, Arabic five hours a day. And we said, you took down the totalitarianism of the Soviet Union. You understand the totalitarianism of the jihadis. Give us a game plan to win this war. And that's the book that came out of it, Fighting the Ideological War, uh, by my wife, Catherine uh, Gorka, with a K. And lastly, I'm so excited. I've never done this before. IWP, this is first time ever. After seven years of people asking me, how do we win this war? I finally decided to write a book. And uh, April 11th, it's out. And you can pre-order it on Amazon now. It's Defeating Jihad. And it's basically what I teach here at IWP. I teach a course in which I say, you know, America can win wars against totalitarians. We've done it a couple of times. And there's a perfect case study of how to do it with every uh, I dotted and every T crossed. And of course, that's what? The Cold War. In the Cold War, in 1946, at a request of the Department of Treasury, a man called George Kennan writes a 14-page secret telegram, a cable, sitting in Moscow, back to D.C., to explain what is Uncle Joe doing. We thought Uncle Joe was on our side. This became the long telegram, the infamous long telegram that Kennan would convert into the sources of Soviet conduct article uh, by Mr. X in Foreign Affairs in 1947. What was that article? That article was an analysis of the enemy threat doctrine of the Soviet Union, communism. What do they believe and why they are an existential threat to the United States? And it was superlative. What happened afterwards? In 1952, a man called Paul Nietzsche was tasked by the president to use Kennan's analysis of the enemy ideology to write the top secret plan to destroy the Soviet Union. That was NSC 68, which was declassified by Kissinger in the 70s. So we had an analysis of the totalitarians, and we had a 60-page strategic secret plan on how to destroy them. The shocking thing is that for 15 years, we have done neither for the jihadists. So this book is, you know, I, I'm just channeling Kennan and Nietzsche, and I wrote a long telegram on what do these people believe? What are the sources of their totalitarianism, and what would a strategy look like to defeat them and secure the republic? And that's the book, Defeating Jihad. Last slide, please. If you've got questions you'd like to ask me offline, or if you're interested in the reports we did for the Green Berets on ISIS, then shoot me an email, seb.gorka at gmail.com, seb.gorka at gmail.com. Everything that I do that's for public consumption is at the gorkabriefing.com, the gorkabriefing.com, all my media, all my, all my analysis. There's, if, if I haven't depressed you enough today, there's a 12-part video lecture on ISIS if you really want to 
get, get deep into it. Everything we do for the US government, for the intelligence community, for law enforcement and the military is at our commercial site, threatknowledge.org. And lastly, my wife is a 501c3, a not-for-profit called the Council on Global Security that monitors the evolution of the jihadi threat. Okay, so what's happening in the Middle East? What's the Brotherhood doing? What's happening in Africa? And if you want to keep on top of the evolution of the ideology, that's councilongloballsecurity.org. So my site, our commercial site, and our 501c3. Um, before I close, um, I, I'd love to share this with you because I'm not sure everybody's read NSC 68. NSC 68, upon which I build my book, opens with the following two paragraphs. This is, so think about this, 1952, a top secret NSC strategy to defeat the Soviet Union. And this is from page five. <clears throat> It's entitled, The Fundamental Purpose of the United States. Interesting title, right? The Fundamental Purpose of the United States. And this is what Nietzsche writes. The fundamental purpose of the United States is laid down in the preamble to the Constitution. Quote, To form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. End quote. In essence, the fundamental purpose of the United States is to assure the integrity and vitality of our free society, which is founded upon the dignity and the worth of the individual. Three realities emerge as a consequence of this purpose. Our determination to maintain the essential elements of individual freedom, as set forth in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, Our determination to create conditions under which our free and democratic system can live and prosper. And our determination to fight, if necessary, to defend our way of life, for which, as in the Declaration of Independence, quote, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. How many documents, top secret or otherwise, do you think in the last 15 years have been written by the US government which quote our founding documents and divine providence and the blessings of liberty? Not enough. Thank you. time for two short questions. <clears throat> yes, sir. Dr. Borman, thank you for your, your lecture. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, jihadis and uh, jihad many times. You mentioned the word religion many times. You, you focus on ISIS. But... Uh, You did mention the Brotherhood twice. Mm -hmm. Do you really think it's just a matter of ISIS? Or what, what does one do as an American citizen in uh, responding to it, uh, Islam, the religion of peace, uh, that, that phrase, mm -hmm. or uh, organizations like CARE, mm -hmm. unindicted co conspirators, but, but which uh, are linked to the Muslim Brotherhood, which may not have uh, uh, knives in their hand, mm -hmm. yeah. but which follow exactly the same right. orientation. Okay, so um, my book is a very practical book. It's meant for as broad an audience as possible. And the fir first appendix is actually the answer to your question. It's entitled something like, What You Need to Do in This War. Because it's, you don't have to carry a gun or a badge or sit in the basement of the Pentagon in an intelligence shop to be part of this war and to win it. And the first thing that every American needs to do is educate yourself and educate everyone around you. And the first thing you can do is actually buy a Quran. Because people say stuff about Islam every day. Most of it is totally fallacious and erroneous. So why don't you check out for yourself what the Quran states? 
Now, this isn't a war against Islam, because there are many different Islams out there. There's no monolithic Islam. I've trained most of the high level of Jordanian special forces. I tell you right now, I would stand in a trench with any of my Jordanian special forces guys and trust them with my life, because they want to destroy ISIS actually worse than we do, because they're the proximate target, yes? It's President Sisi, King Abdullah II of Jordan, who are the prime. They'll kill us sooner or later. They'll get to us, okay? But the jihadis need to take down the King of Jordan. They need to take down President Sisi, okay? So for me, it has to be understood like this. When somebody says something that's utterly fallacious, tell them what it truly is. Tell them what the situation really entails. Take, take religion out of the equation, yeah? And tell them it's about this. It's about the Constitution. And if that group uh, are the Ku Klux Klan, if they're commies, if they're fascists or jihadis, what links all of them? They all want to destroy this. Just take religion out of it, right? It's, whether you're a Nazi, whether you're a Soviet agent, or whether you're a jihadi, this is the problem, our values. And be very explicit with them. The problem is the following. A 7th century traditional fundamentalist, very textually bound version of Islam is in ascendance. That's the problem. The Jordanian version of Islam, the Egyptian version of Islam, that's not sexy, that's not cool. The black flag of jihad is far too attractive from the streets of Paris to San Bernardino. And we need to work in collaboration, you know, hip to hip, with our Muslim allies in the region to make sure it's their version of Islam that is in ascendance. This isn't about a war in, between religions, it's a war within a religion that affects us. And I'll, I'll end on, on one quote. President, I've met President Sisi. I had two and a half hours with him before he became president. This is a devoutly religious man. When he's not wearing a hat, you can see he has what they call a raisin, like Zawahiri. Okay, the head of Al-Qaeda. This man prays so hard on that prayer mat five times a day, he has a callus on his forehead. If you read his dissertation from the Army War College, it's all about religion and modernity. But this man is uh, the solution to the problem. Yeah? What did he say New Year's Day? Not this year, but last year. New Year's Day, he walks in, public meeting, to the most important religious institution in the Sunni world. They have no pope, okay, but they have a Vatican. It's called the Al-Azhar. And he walks into the Al-Azhar in front of the most powerful theologians of all Sunni Islam. And he says to them, gentlemen, you have to help me execute a religious revolution because the jihadis are winning. That's the problem, right? There is a revolution in Islam to define it along the 7th century Medinan verses that say kill all infidels, right? And we're only going to win it, we're not going to win it by ourselves. It's going to be the Egyptians, the Jordanians, the UAE, the Kurds together. But the trouble is none of them trust us. And you know what? If I were a Jordanian officer, I wouldn't trust us either after the last seven and a half years. So whoever wins the election in November, they're going to have their work cut out for them. Last question. I think Richard had a um, Talk a little, bit, a little bit, please, about the religion of American economy. Now, the reason I ask that question is you said there's this huge political cloud that's sitting on top of our intelligence apparatus. So they, these, there's some very powerful policymakers and politicians, not just economists. Who've got their minds made up about the nature of this conflict? Can you give us? I, I, I'm, I'm, you're, you're being a, too obtuse. Like I, I can't. I don't know what you're referring to. All right, you referred to um, political reasons that people at the upper levels of our intelligence agencies. Yeah. They're getting good information from the intelligence. Right. We right. About, okay. And they're just. Okay. All right. They're not reading it. Well, they're, they're censoring it. Yeah, they're changing yeah, they're it. So, how does it? What was so the what's economics? So, what's going on in their heads? You've done a great job of helping us get inside the heads of, of ISIS. What's going on in the heads of our politicians? Oh, politicians? oh. So, why are we where we are? Okay, you lost me the whole economist sorry, thing. I'm okay, sorry. all right. Uh, if you want the answer, go to the person who really knows. So, go to my wife. Go to the Council on Global Security, uh -huh. and she wrote a white paper called "The Flawed Science Between uh, Behind U.S. Counterterrorism Policy." The flawed science 
behind U.S. counterterrorism strategy, I think, on policy. It is chapter and verse. This, this, if you want to know why we are where we are, read this 22 pages. I'll give you the cliff notes. Okay, so uh, re reason number one um, is one I already alluded to. If you, most of the people on the Hill, with the odd exception, see themselves as what? Sophisticated, postmodern, right? I, I, I'm, a, I'm a modern man. And what are they, what's their attitude to religion? It's the Freudian interpretation, right? Religion is what? A power trip by guys in skirts or guys with, you know, it's, it's a power trip. So they dismiss religion. Okay, if you dismiss religion, uh, you're never going to understand jihad. Problem number one, right? I mean, you can't, how can you even understand a, the logic of a suicide bomber? It's literally impossible for you to commute, compute if religion is just some fallacious construct made by man. So that's the, the first kind of ontological problem with the whole issue. Secondly, is, is a really bad one, and this is my wife's paper. There was a man inside the National, uh, National Counterterrorism Center um, who was uh, an, an expert, he came from academe, who, who specialized on radical Islam. And he spent a few years at NCTC, and then he was picked up by the White House, and he was lifted into the National Security Council. This man convinced the cabinet of the following analysis and the consequent uh, policies. He said, in the world of Islam, there are several groups who believe the caliphate must be re-established. There are the purists who say, we'll just do it through proselytizing, through dawah, through education. Then there are the political pro-caliphate individuals who say they're going to use non-kinetic means. They're going to use elections, mobilization. Uh, this is, of course, who the Muslim Brotherhood, right? They're going to use you know, democracy against itself to create the caliphate. And the guys we really care about are the tiny minority. The, the kinetic pro-caliphate people, the jihadists, like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And he said, he, he said that these are three hermetically sealed communities. A. Wrong. Okay. Anyway. And he said, because there are two different groups, at least, who have a chance of creating the caliphate, the only way to save America from the next 9-11, from the kinetic jihadists, is to negotiate with and recognize the brotherhood. This man convinced the administration about six years ago the only way to save America from the next 9-11 is if the Brotherhood is empowered to stop groups like Al-Qaeda. That's why these things happened in Cairo as they did. So we have A, a, a matrix which does not permit you to understand the enemy because of where you stand in your worldview. And secondly, just a completely <laughs> wrong analysis of who our enemies are and thinking that the Muslim Brotherhood are a bunch of, you know, frustrated Jeffersonian Democrats. That's why we are where we are. But check out my wife's paper.